Hello, and welcome to another episode of For the Love of Sports. My name is Michael Brazil, and this is a show where we get to talk about sports, we get to talk about business, we get to talk about everything in between, wherever you're listening, however you're listening, you know exactly what to do. YouTube, smash that like and subscribe button for me. Leave a comment on some of the cool things that Taj is going to talk about. Spotify, five-star review, and on Apple, five-star review, and say something really nice about me and my guest, who is... Taj Deshaun, he is an athlete transition coach, coach, of, uh, an author of multiple books, host of the Thrive After Sports podcast, and is a former Division One football player over at Stony Brook University. Taj, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, man. Honored to be on the show. Thank you for that intro. I've been following you for a minute, so to be a guest, it's a big deal for me, man. That's, Appreciate yeah. you having me. It's a big deal for me, too. Like, not too many people check out the show, hang out with it as long, and then, you know, ask to come on. So, I mean, I, I'm great, grateful that you've been a listener, grateful that you're now on the show and you get to share your story sure you know a lot of the questions I'm going to ask. So this is actually probably going to be a really easy one for both of us. But Taj, before we get into all the incredible stuff you've done and what you're doing, I mean, you know, the first question on the For the Love of Sports podcast is, why do you love sports so much? I love sports, and I honestly didn't realize this till I stopped playing sports. But I realized that I love sports because they're such a great representation of life and what it means to be a human being. When you talk about collaboration, competition, um, even if you're not a competitive person, like we all want to compete with ourselves, at least most of us, you know, and I think I read somewhere, I don't know where I found this, but football, which as you mentioned, is a sport that I played football was actually invented, um, for guys who weren't, you know, at war to be able to get out their aggression back in the day. So when I think about me, how wild I was as a kid and guys that I grew up with, if we didn't have football, there's no telling where we would be, man. So that's why I love the game. That's why I love sports in general. Yeah, baseball could only take in so much out of you. <laughs> like, I mean, a comparison of those two sports, right? I love baseball. I love football. I love pretty much all sports. But, yeah, I don't think too much aggression is coming out in baseball. More just snarky comments and, uh, you know, maybe you get hit by a pitch every once in a while. But, yeah, not quite the same amount of aggression is coming out of that. All the aggression I've seen in baseball, man, is between the coaches and the umpire. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and that one time that Rugnet Odor just absolutely dropped jo uh, Joey Bats. That was – I mean, that, that was pretty awesome. But other than that, yeah, it's it's not too much going on there. But no, I, and I appreciate it again, you coming on and getting to tell your story, because I think with, you know, with specifically, I mean, all athletes, right? I've interviewed hundreds of Olympic athletes. I've interviewed hundreds of other athletes. And everyone kind of always has a, has a similar piece of their story where it's your, your career is coming to an end, whether you want it to or not. I mean, father time is undefeated, uh, injuries, you know, literally you can pick any of the reasons why a career ends. It's going to end. Even the greatest, Tom Brady, at some point, dude's going to retire. And honestly, he only looked okay this year. We can already kind of see the writing on the wall, right? So it's it's one of those things where no matter what, you can be the greatest ever. The, your career is going to come to an end. And I think one thing that we always forget, right, there's that stat. What is it, like 92% of college athletes will go pro and something else, like a nice, cute little uh, you know, little tagline. Thanks, NCAA, for you know not screwing that one up. But I think the thing is about that is those other athletes – and really, all 100% of them will come to an end with that sport. And that is kind of a traumatic point. I don't want to be like, you know, a little dramatic about it, but it's very traumatic to most athletes because, like yourself, you played football for how many years and it eventually comes to an end? Like, tell us a little bit about that. Like, you know, your football career, we don't have to get into stats and numbers, but I'm kind of curious, like, how long did you play? What was it like? As you said, you used it for your aggression, but once you got older, realized you could utilize it, go to college and kind of take this and run with it for a little bit, what was it like when it then finally ended? Man. I started playing around nine or 10 and the first goal was to just make varsity by the time I was in high school, check that off as a freshman. Then it was to get a D one scholarship, check that off. And of course the next goal was to go pro. Hell yeah. I quickly realized that that wasn't going to happen for me right around sophomore, junior year. And so I kind of went into my transition out of football already with like this feeling of, damn, I fell short, you know, already this like feeling of, I'm not going to make it pro. What am I going to do with my life? And so, I just kind of figured everything would always it would work out like it always had because you know when you're a great athlete things come to you people opportunities you know life's pretty much handed to you on a silver platter and so that didn't happen and i quickly found myself back home in my childhood bedroom uh with no idea what i was going to do no job prospects didn't even know how to put a resume together even if i did i didn't know what i wanted to do anyway i got a i majored in eligibility you know i got a, a basket weaving degree multidisciplinary studies whatever that is so I was lost, man, and quickly just went into this downward spiral of depression um, at the time, which I'm sure we'll get into. At the time, I thought I was the only one going through this. I didn't realize this was something that all athletes go through, like you said. But for me, it just led to a lot of isolation, a lot of drinking, and a lot of just confusion about who I was and where I was going and how I was going to pick myself up from 
uh, this loss of identity and just lack of clarity about what the rest of my life was going to look like. Loss of identity. I think that's an awesome way to put it. Um, unfortunate, but very awesome way to put it because yeah, like again, as you said, you were a star athlete, you go division one. I. I don't care what division one school you're going to, you're going division one. That's still top 1%, right? Like we're not like, a, you're not just some schlub, right? Like that is still incredible. I don't care what school you're going to, right? Whether it's Alabama or, you know, FAU or wherever, right? And I think it's pretty impressive. And, you know, once that is again, taken away from you, it's unfortunate. Now I'm, I'm kind of curious, right? You said you kind of knew by your sophomore, junior year, you weren't going pro was that because they told you like dude you don't have it were you injured like what exactly like i, I want to understand the beginning of i guess we can call the, the spiral downward it wasn't so everybody always blames the politics that's something you hear oh the coaches this the coaches, coaches didn't that. like me yeah um, so i use that one in the past it's cool <laughs> i used to use that too man these days just uh i have the with maturity comes you know i just wasn't good enough to make it even if i had the perfect coaches and no coaching changes like I don't think I was honestly good enough, even if I had a great career at Stony Brook, because I know guys who did and still didn't make it. So that's just the reality of the situation, man. But um, as a young man, of course, everyone who makes it to the D1 level just assumes you're going pro until you get hit with reality. And you're like, oh, shit, this this might actually not happen. That's kind of crazy. And so so then you, you understand that. And as you said, you're, you kind of start your transition a little early because you understand, hey, like uh, there's almost like a countdown clock on this thing. What was it like when, like, as you said, you, you just assumed things were going to come to you because they always have. So why would you not assume that at 20, 21? I mean, I assumed that I was nowhere near a star athlete. I just assumed all good things would happen to me. And I mean, some did, some didn't, but like, you know, it's one of those things. Like, it, was there any point in time, again, immaturity probably has a role to play in this. You, you didn't start thinking like, Hey, like, do I go to the counselors? Like, you, you know, you hear all these schools and how they tout how much they want to help athletes. And if you're not going pro, we want to help you go pro and something else. Was there... Was there something you needed to do on your end to take advantage of that? Did the school just not provide those benefits to you? Like where, where was kind of the give and take there? I think, of course, with hindsight being 2020, I think, of course, there's things I could have done. I mean, I graduated in 2013, so, you know, a decade ago at this point. The conversation around transition and, you know, making sure those opportunities are getting in front of athletes um, and the universities are doing a much better job of making that happen. At the time, um, I didn't really – hear anything about that the coaches that were there at the time weren't necessarily too big on you know helping prepare for life after the game it was more so you guys are here to play football despite what they tell you you're an athlete student those were real conversations that that's they had awesome see we, we all kind of knew that but at least right. i appreciate them being honest about it at least lied to me you know yeah exactly uh, yeah, right. <laughs> the honesty at back then i was like yeah i do kind of appreciate it but in hindsight it's like man they actually don't care you know um so the transparency is cool but the fact that they didn't, didn't care was kind of sad and it's come a long way uh, with, with many universities, not just the coaching staffs, but the, the people there. But to answer your question, uh, there wasn't really any preparation thrown my way, at least that I, not, that I knew of. And at the same time, I could have done a better job of seeking it out. I think I was, it was one of those things where maybe I just kind of like put it into a different corner of my mind because I was so afraid that I just didn't want to think about it, which causes the lack of preparation, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. And that makes sense. And that's, it's unfortunate. As you said, this was 13 years ago now. So hopefully things have changed, right? Um, we kind of see all the dollars that are flowing into college football, whether again, you're on that top scale, you're on those bottom scales, there's still an opportunity, uh, for, for someone like you to hopefully now be able to take advantage of some of those things. Cause I think it is important, right? I don't want to sit here and be like, you know, did you really think, I mean, you went to Stony Brook, like how many dudes come out of Stony? I don't want to sound like an asshole, right? But like how many dudes come out of Stony Brook at some point, you've probably been like, you know, if no one else is coming knocking on my door, but I mean, again, you're a 20 year old kid. What the hell do you know? Right. Exactly. And then you always think, well, maybe I'll be the one. I'll be yeah. the one to put hey, the man. school on the map. <laughs> there was always a first. Why not you, dude? Why not right. you, Taj? I love it. Um, so then when it does come to an end, as you said, you kind of fell into some depression. You went home. You're in your childhood bedroom. Probably has some weird posters up on your wall. Uh, you know, you're, you're kind of dealing with all that stuff. Like what, how, like, I'm sure there's. There has to be some period of self-loathing. If something like this happens to anyone in life, you have to have a little bit of that, right? Like I, I believe in turning negatives into positive, the whole thing. But like, you have to have a period of like, let's get a little weird for a couple of weeks and then pick yourself up. Like, did you have that, or did that period extend just a little too long? When when did you start to kind of realize that you were even in that period? I guess. Um, that period was probably about a year, and oh, things wow. did get pretty weird because I'm I mean, sure. you talk about like a few of us guys were back home. Um, in our hometown from going to play D1 and we're all back home in the same position. And so all we were really doing was we had an extended college. Like we were out drinking Thursday through Sunday to distract ourselves from what we were experiencing. So it, most of my time was spent drinking, um, smoking, 
just being in my room watching Netflix, you know, laying in bed, chilling, sleeping until noon because I was hungover. And so it took a while for me to get to a point where, like, I was out of shape. I couldn't even run around the block without being winded. Um, and I got to a point where I was, like, tired of living like that. You know, I remember waking up one morning, probably at noon, looking in the mirror and being like, bro, what are you doing? Like, this is not who you are. You don't know what you want to do, but you can at least start moving in a positive direction and try to figure something out or at least just, you know, make some sort of get some sort of momentum going and, and let things work out. Give yourself a chance to let things work out. And that's kind of, you know, where I ended up after that period of self-loathing, which lasted way too long to your point. Hey, hey man, it got you to here. So I think that's the important part, right? You're on the For the Love of Sports podcast, Taj. It's, this is, it just goes downhill from here. No, of course, I'm kidding. I think it's it's important, right? We need all those twists and turns. And like, if you didn't do all that, you might not get to where you are now. I think that uh, I'm a true believer in the butterfly effect in that sense where we're, we're grateful for all of it because it taught you a lot of lessons. And honestly, you probably had some fun too. Like, let's not like, yeah, like we look back on it. It's like, yeah, it was like a year and, you know, but like, I'm sure you had a little bit of fun in there. But more importantly, I think the, what I really want to get at there is is how the fact that you actually had the awareness and you were able to be like, yo, let's wait a second. Like having that conversation with yourself is kind of difficult. Like I feel like so many people, it's so easy to just keep doing that and doing that and doing that, especially if you have a group of people to do it with, you're all doing it together. It's cool. Like we're, we're all, we are, we're all doing this. Like, it's not that big a deal. Like, did you have these conversations with your friends? Did you realize that they might've been depressed? Like, again, you got, you're all on the outside, probably having a good time, but realizing kind of on the inside, you're like, damn, this is like, okay. Am I just doing this now? Like, what are we doing? Like, did you have those conversations externally with your friends or anyone else in your family or anything? Towards the tail end of it, um, yeah. I, I think, honestly, I was too isolated. When it comes to, I'm addressing your point about my family. Like, I didn't talk to them because I didn't think they would understand. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a great, I was very fortunate that they even let me move back in after college. I know a lot of people don't have that luxury, right? But I was so isolated and didn't really understand what I was going through to the point where I could, like, articulate it and share it with them. Um, and when it comes to, like, you know, former teammates and guys I was back home with, we didn't have the, we all knew, we were basically getting together, drinking, partying, and, like, complaining versus, because we didn't have the emotional maturity to be like, hey, mm -hmm. what can we do about this? Or, like, how can we process these emotions? It's just like, hey, let's go pick up a bottle and try to distract ourselves from what we're dealing with right now and go hit the club. You know, it was more so that type of mentality. Towards the tail end, we did, the, we did start, all of us at the same time kind of realized, like, all right, well, us drinking and being out all the time isn't really helping. So, like, what can we do? And we all kind of, I wish we would have stuck together a little more. Everyone's doing their own thing and doing great in life now. But we all started to figure it out and grow up and become, you know, young men and adults over time. Is this when you realized you're not the only athlete going through this? Um, honestly, I, it didn't hit me until I actually started doing this work. You know, okay. and because what happened was I didn't start Thrive After Sports until five years from when I was already removed from college. Like by the time I had that conversation with myself that day, like, bro, you got to get your life together. That's when I started taking my personal development seriously, stopped drinking, um, started working out again, started reading. I re rediscovered my, my love for like reading and personal development, listening to podcasts. Um, I didn't know what I wanted, but I was like, let me just try to get something. Let me just apply for jobs, which is not a strategy I recommend, especially these days by any mean. But it, it's better than what I was doing. It's better than nothing, that's for sure. Exactly. Like, yeah, one step in the right direction is more than zero steps in the right direction. That's exactly it. And so I was, what I was getting at is, like, after I started to pick myself up, started getting jobs, started, like, you know, making a little post-college career for myself, making money, steady income, all that type of stuff, I realized throughout the course of that five years while I was removed, I had a lot of teammates who were coming up behind me who were telling me the same thing, that they were still dealing with it. And then I hit a point eventually where it was happening so much and I was talking to so many guys and they were like sending people my way who weren't football players. And I'm like, oh, this isn't just a football thing either. Then I was like, all right, let me look into this and let me see if there's anything that I can do. And it was just that perfect storm of like, all right, this is a problem. I have a skill set that I've developed where I think I can address this. Um, and also I wanted to do something that I felt I could make a bigger impact than I was making in my corporate roles. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. 100%. And I think that's awesome. And you're starting to kind of figure that out along the way. You're realizing so much more about how you probably were able to look back and be like, oh, I wish I knew, like, I wish I figured this out sooner. Me and all my buddies probably could have had that conversation. But as you said, emotional maturity kind of, uh, it, it might not have been the same, but at the same time, I think it's still really important. And so when, when you start having these conversations with people, at what point do you start to be like, okay, I understand this isn't just a me thing. This is an all athletes thing in all spaces, right? Again, all these athletes have been treated like gold since they were six, seven, eight, nine. They go through life. They're in college. They're not going pro, but 
there's really nothing after college for 99 percent of athletes in, in terms of the sports right i can go play beer league softball but i was only jv baseball player in high school like it was really not much you know, i didn't really matter it was just something fun to do when you start having conversations with all these people when like what what are some of these initial conversations like right like you don't have any training you don't really you're just kind of just are you more just like a sounding board and just being like yeah dude like let it out and i can just kind of tell you a little bit about what i did i'm sure now there's a much more sp- specific thing you got going on but like what were some of those initial conversations like that's definitely how it started michael like it was more so this is what i did i like i know what you're going through and that even that alone made such a big difference for people to know like hey i went through this too so you're not alone this is normal explaining that to them and then getting to a point where i told them what i actually did and then giving them advice based on their specific uh situation and helping them figure out where, where they wanted to go and it timed up perfectly because it got to the point where I was enjoying doing these calls so much that I would like, you know, a lot of these guys were back on the East Coast coming out of Stony Brook or whatever the case was. And I would do it. I was in California at the time, so I could do it like, you know, before work in the mornings or like when I got off of work or on the weekends, I would do these phone calls. And to me, it was it was the type of thing where I was like, man, this is something that um, I think there's an opportunity, especially as I was researching what was actually available for athletes at this time. I was like, there's an opportunity for like me to really create something here. It's going to take a while. And I knew that going into it, but I think if I do it the right way and I help enough people that this could really make a big difference over time. How did you like, this sounds like a business already just without getting paid. Like how did your name spread? How did you start to like, be like, yeah, I, I, I understand you enjoy the conversations, right? But it's probably like, oh, I'll do one here. I'll do one there. Oh, cool. Yeah. We can, we can text a little bit. Like how did you start to like, I guess, solidify this a little bit more and really have your name spread enough to the point where you're scheduling multiple calls a day, it sounds like? Yeah, of course, word of mouth is great. Still, referrals are like, I'd say 50% if not, if not more That's of awesome. how I, you know, help athletes. But I started putting out content, you know, and it's funny because I had deleted all of my social media when I was done playing because I was so depressed. So the only platform that I was on at the time was LinkedIn because I was looking for opportunities to get jobs and trying to connect with people. So I really just started on LinkedIn and I started putting, I started writing articles about athlete transition. Those got a lot of love and people were sharing them around and people were reaching out to me telling me like, oh, I finally feel like I'm not alone. Started putting out videos, um, eventually started a podcast, which I started that in 2019. So I'd already been coaching um, a couple years at that point. And, you know, it, it just really, I started just sharing things that I never wanted to be the type of guy where I was like, Hey, I'm going to share this with you, but you have to pay me in order for me to like, to like really help you. It's like, I know by putting out the podcast, which is probably the same reason you have a podcast. There are people who you will never meet or never talk to who are going to be impacted by the conversations that are had on the podcast or even the solo episodes that you do. So that was my approach going in. I'm just like, let me just share all this stuff. Cause I know it's going to reach someone somewhere and it's going to help them. And you know, I'm only one person as you know, like you said, I can't talk to everybody. Yeah. But if you, you you know, you're planting seeds of trees that you'll never be able to center underneath. Right. But at the same time, you're still able to help these people in some way, shape or form, even if it's just 1%. I mean, that's, you know, that's worth the episode. That's worth the hundred episodes, however many you're up to at this point. Like, I think that's the important part is that, you know, you're still getting that information out there. And Oh, by the way, it's not a bad, it's not a bad business development tool, right? You're able to interview people, get that information out there. There's a lot of awesome stuff that can come from it too. So I think that part's pretty important. Um, And I think, you know, obviously content is king, especially in, you know, social media, it's web 2.0 as we're we're now apparently calling it. Um, So I think that that part is, is pretty important and you were able to take advantage of that, I guess. So with that, so you're having all these calls, you're doing your normal job. As you said, you kind of thought that there was something here. Clearly there was. When do you say, okay, this is this is going to be a business. This is what I'm going to start doing and really focusing on, maybe as a side hustle, but at least start trying to bring in a couple dollars along the way. Yeah, man, I always tell people that I quit my job way too early. I definitely <laughs> could because I could have done both. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I was so I was so like done with corporate lifestyle and ready to like go full speed into this new mission that I had, you know, found and created for myself that the first time I had a paying client and I'll tell you now, these days, what I do is, um, I know a lot of athletes, especially coming out of college, they're not working or they're in their first job. They're just getting on their feet or they're like I was. So even from the get go, I had the mentality of my long-term strategy is not to charge athletes one-to-one or, you know, charge them for a course or something like that. So I knew I wanted to set up sponsorships or have universities pay for this type of work. But early on, man, like 
I remember I had my first paying client. He was a former NFL guy and he paid me 1500 for eight weeks. And I was like, I'm gonna quit my job, which was completely <laughs> dumb because like, I didn't, have, I didn't see another penny for like six months. I was gonna say that, you know, that's not bad, but like, that's also, I don't know, like a two week paycheck. Like, right. <laughs> it's so, like, that's like a half a month paycheck. Like, yeah, for eight weeks. Like all right, math doesn't work out, but that's awesome that you did it. Yeah, man. So that was, um, that's so funny looking back at it now. But like you said, I wouldn't be here if I didn't like take mm -hmm. the bumps and the bruises. Yeah. Went completely broke. But even that, like going broke and like having to move out of my apartment, having to move back in with my parents at one point. Back into that bedroom, uh, poster still on the wall. Man, poster still. I love there. it. Love it. It was a beautiful thing, man. Um, but that almost proved to me that I was willing mm -hmm. to go through that because it was that serious. Like as tough as it was, it showed me like, oh, you actually really do care about this. Otherwise, you wouldn't have put yourself in this back against the wall position. And five years later, man, like I'm doing all right now. And it's because I've set up systems. So, but you, I'm sorry, man, you asked me a question. I feel like I could. Dude, I have no idea. Whatever you answered right. in a great way. I think that's important. And I also want to point out like the moving back into your parents' house two different times, the, the mindset that you're in both times, right? That first time it was, you know, this sucks. I'm depressed. I'm going to go out drinking with my buddies. Like this is the worst. And now the second time is this sucks, but there's like a huge reason I'm doing it. And like the, the weight behind both of them is probably equal, but the one, the momentum is significantly more on that second one. Cause you were able to stop that first train. It looks like obviously, but the second one, I think that's so important that you can kind of, it's, it's, I mean, I have only had to move back in my parents' house once and that was cause I came back from college. But like, I, if I had to do it again, like I might've just gotten a job if I, you know, right. Like a lot of people. And like, you know, I say that kind of kidding, but like, I'm sure a lot of people would have just been like, let me get a job and then I'll make this my side hustle. Instead, you said, no, screw it. Like I'm full steam ahead, like whatever it takes. And you moving back into your parents' house that second time, that mindset, that mentality was probably so significantly different. I think that's a really important piece of the story. Thank you, man. That's deep, Michael. I never thought about it like that before either. I never thought about how different the mindsets were like between the first and the second time moving in. Um, and just, you know, what you were just saying about getting a job, most people would do that. I mean, I did pick up some part-time kind of odd jobs along the way. But I knew that I couldn't go back into like nine Full to five yeah. drive, sitting in traffic, going to an office because I wouldn't have had the energy to be able to build. Um, that's just how I'm wired. I knew myself. I knew I didn't have a choice but to like just try to make this work while I was doing odd jobs in the meantime, you know. Totally. Yeah. Get a waiter job. You could work a couple of days a week here and there, make a couple bucks, you know, rock with it. Um, and so, so you got that first, I'm, I'm curious more about that first paying client, that ex NFL guy. We don't have to go into the people and their names, of course, but like what, like obviously a, that must've just been so cool that some guys like, yeah, here's some money, but what was your eight week course at the time? Like what, like, did you have it built out? Was this something you were working on for a period of time where you're like, if I was to do it, it would be week one, two, three, four, five, six, or were you kind of like, yeah, well, let's do this for eight weeks and kind of learning along the way kind of thing. No, so by then, by the time I worked with him, I already had curriculum and a game plan. Oh, wow. Right okay. Out because Very cool. by the time I quit my job, um, it was I was already starting to build it and structure it the way I wanted it to look. Now, of course, coaching, just like any, any form of coaching, really, it can't be cookie cutter. Like, okay, it's week yeah. one. We're going to do this week two. So a lot of it is coaching on my feet still to this day. But I had a general roadmap and a framework for how I wanted to guide athletes through this process based on what I went through, based on those conversations I was having long before I officially started it. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I already had the roadmap set up and I can go into it if you want. I don't want, I don't want to. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I was, I was curious about that aspect and really finding clients, but obviously we want to like, we, we've kind of been talking about it here for 20 minutes. You're, you're an athlete transition coach, but what exactly like, what does that mean? What are, what are you helping athletes with that you are a very, very important piece of their life for at a minimum two months? So I, it's tough because I never, it's like the best example I could give you is almost a combination of a life coach and a career coach, but me, and this is just pure ego, man. Like I never want to limit myself to those two things. Like, cause I always say athlete transition coach is something very specialized and very specific that I'm helping with that I came up with. But ultimately my goal is I want to never come to someone and say, so what are you thinking about doing with your, with your life now? Like that's, it's way too soon for that conversation. So understanding that there's a healing that has to take place because of that loss of identity, I address that right away and make sure there's no like mental, spiritual, emotional blocks that could hold us back as we continue to move forward through the process. So we do the heavy lifting up front. That's where usually, you know, there's some tears on those calls. Um, people really open up to me cause they know I've been through it. So we address that stuff. 
And then once they're at a place where they're ready to fire on all cylinders again, like, okay, I'm excited. I know I have the rest of my life ahead of me. Let's get to work. Let's create. Then we go into like pure creation mode, not just I'll help someone get a job if they need to pay bills, but I'm thinking like long term. You know, what are you actually going to be just as excited about, if not more excited about as you were when you were playing your sport and helping them lock in and create that vision and come up with steps to get there. And then once the vision's clear, I spend the last, you know, two to three, give or take, I spend that last portion of the program um, connecting them with other people, other former athletes who are doing something similar that they can run together or that person can be another mentor to them. So it's really just those three pillars. The eight weeks is broken down into that kind of like three step process with a lot of little, you know, subcategories mm -hmm. that we're thinking about. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Break them down, build them up and then help them out. Right. Like I think that's a, like a super, you know, convenient, easy way of doing it. The military <laughs> for all the good <laughs> and the bad, man, like they've done some things right. They understand how humans work. So no, I think that it's really important. And like uh, understanding that aspect, like, as you said, that, that first piece, um, with kind of breaking everyone down a little bit essentially and then saying like them realizing that they have their whole life in front of them it's so easy at 22 to think this is this is this is this is my life like this is my life this is never going to change now being 31 and being you know having some sort of self-awareness and being able to look at things and be like yeah it kind of sucks right now but like this is just a, a single moment in time and things are going to change and i'm going to be different and i'm going to grow as a human and like it's so easy for a 20 year old that again just had their literal life taken away from them i can't really attest to that you can thankfully though like what what is it like when you kind of get that initial breakthrough of them being like yeah you're you're actually right i have I don't know, a solid 60 years left potentially to live on this earth. I'm a quarter of the way through this thing. Why am I dwelling on this one thing when I can use everything I've learned, I can use everything I've taken from this sport that I've loved so much and push it forward into anything else that I want to do? Yeah. It's one of my favorite things, man, because then it, then it becomes fun. Yeah. And I, I really want them to see that too, that, okay, now we get to have fun. Now you get to create. And this is something you're going to do for the rest of your life. Life has many transitions. So this is a skill. If anything, man, the, the part that excites me the most is that I know I'm teaching them a skill that they can use for the rest of their lives. So anytime you're lost or some one path doesn't work out, you know how to recalibrate, readjust, map out your next steps and just figure out how to get there. So it, it's a big deal to me because I remember when I had that epiphany, like, oh, I'm going to live a long time and I get to create. It's it's exciting, man. And then another thing I try to instill in them is like, you know, I always tell people like you're still a role model. You got to think about all your little you know, maybe they have younger siblings or nieces or nephews or cousins or even people older than you who look at you like you were this, you know, superhero almost playing your sport. And now that you're done, you're just going to like throw in the towel and just kind of settle for a mediocre life. Or you can go do something great and show them like what it looks like to build a life for yourself and be bigger than your sport. So to answer your question, man, that's that's one of my favorite moments when they when the light bulb goes off and they're like, oh, wow, yeah, I do have a long time. It's like it's yeah. a small window, like you said. Yeah, this is, this is, I mean, I don't remember anything before like six anyway. So like you're essentially, it's like 18 years of your life. Like, come on, like you're less than that. You got time. Like, um, a couple of other things, obviously I want to talk about like the, so we were talking about finding clients. And as you said, like in the beginning, you already knew like this was not going to be a one-to-one -one as much as it was going to be a one-to-many in some way, shape or form. How, what was it like? in the beginning, trying to go to those colleges, go to those sponsors and just try and find ways to be like, you give me a couple dollars, I'll help all of these athletes out. Like you have to convince them that it's worth it to them because you're just an expense, right? Like I'm sure you can spin it, not spin it. I'm sure you can show away how you're much more than just an expense to the university. But in the beginning, they're just looking at it as this is a line item. What am I getting for this? So how were you able to kind of push through and give them that understanding of this is a significant help, not to just you and your students, like to the university as a whole, because we're making, you know, the well-being of these players significantly better in the long term. Yeah, man. Great question. So thank you. I'd say <laughs> you're killing it, man. You're a great host. I, I do what I can. Thomas. You've listened to the show before, man. You know all this stuff. It's the handheld mic, man. That's what gives you Dude. the extra swag as a host. That's what I it love. Is. It. I appreciate it, man. <laughs> but I'd say even these days, man, a lot of my, um, so I'll put it like this. Universities are not the bulk of where okay. the clients or the sponsorships are coming from. I'm very fortunate that it's one of those build, if you build it, they will come type of situations. Meaning, you know, really in 2017, athlete mental health, athlete transition wasn't really a topic of conversation. With each passing year, it's just exploded, especially with COVID and athletes not being able to compete. 
So more and more companies are popping up. More companies want to sponsor this type of work. Um, and I'm fortunate where even nonprofits like Athlete Soul, you know, I want to shout out there's... Miriam. Shout out. Has she been on the show? I think so. Yeah, pretty sure. Long time ago. This is middle of COVID long time ago. Can't tell okay. you the episode. She's incredible, though. She is. And we actually connected around the same time. She was really just kind of getting Athlete Soul going, which obviously was tough because of COVID with fundraising. But we found out about each other. We connected and it was like a natural fit for me to do coaching for her organization as well. So you see organizations like Athlete Soul, um, organizations like Athlete Transition Services, you know, Jonathan Orr. He's been in the game doing workshops at universities for a long time. So it's very easy for me because I don't have a nonprofit. I'm self-employed. I'm just a one man band. But for me to connect with these people and be able to contract my services and I can have my co my coaching sponsored by money that's raised through nonprofits. Um, or if we go into a university together, instead of me saying, hey, I want you to cut me a check, we can go in and we can be creative with the athletic departments and find donors or you know local businesses like a local bank who wants to have their name attached for PR purposes to do this type of work and they can donate and pass it through a nonprofit so everybody's happy. It's a write-off, it's win-wins across the board, and ultimately the athletes get the type of help and services that they need. So that's what I mean by being creative. Yeah. And then aside from that, you know, I still do have athletes who will pay me directly. A lot of them are like professional athletes, or let's say someone is making a, a great salary, but they hate their life. Like, hey, I graduated five years ago and I'm in a six-figure job, I'm making good money, but I still miss the game, I'm still unhappy with where I'm at. They'll pay me directly understanding that that money is going towards helping people who can't afford to pay me. I'll even have them, if they can't pay me directly, a lot of times what I'll do these days is just have them donate to the nonprofit. And then the, one of my nonprofit partners can pass it along to me. So that's been a structure and a formula that I found is um, it, it checks the box of my ultimate goal, like I said, which is to not have the athletes coming out of pocket, but making sure that I can put food on the table as well. Yeah, because if you're not making money, you're not able to help them, right? It's a, it's a pretty simple equation there. You need to make money to help as many people as you can. We understand how business works, but I mm -hmm. appreciate your creativity and just trying to find any way to figure it out, especially now with like, I don't know how much you've had to delve into like the NIL space of things, but I'm sure there's some businesses out there that would be willing to give these athletes money directly, right, for an NIL type sponsorship or a type deal where then they can kind of, you know, be able to then pay you with some of that money in some way, shape or form. There's a lot of ways that we can get into this now, thankfully, because the NCAA is, you know, hopefully going away soon. Totally other conversation for another time. <laughs> I think one thing that's really interesting is the universities. OK, so I understand. Again, I, I said it before. You're really just an expense. Again, heavy quotations, but in all in, in all in all in accounting, you're just an expense at that point. Right. How much are you? And again, you've only been doing this for what five, six, seven years at this point. So uh, five years, yep. a lot of time to slowly come. And you're going to keep crushing it, Taj. And we appreciate you and doing what you're doing. I believe in preventative care, right? Getting ahead of the game, being able to help people before things are wrong. That's why I hate insurance so much because they don't let you do anything before you get hurt. It's everything after you get hurt. So it's like, well, if you just helped me before, would have been cheaper and better and everyone would have been happy. So also another conversation. But how much are you trying to lean into that? Because like, uh, like that is, is obviously such an important piece. Just get these kids to understand again, these, these sophomores and juniors who kind of know that they're not going pro. Like how much better would it have been for you if someone came to you at 20 rather than you having to figure it out on your own at 23 that like, hey, get this in your brain. Like this is coming whether you like it or not. So you kind of have to figure it out. Let me help you through this. How much are you trying to focus on that? Or, or is that something that you're really trying to focus on maybe in the future or something? Because I think that will be huge. And that is something that universities could really latch on to. You know, I have a two-part answer to that. I'll try to Hell keep yeah. it brief. No, but dude, you got time. The first thing I'll say is that there are a lot of great people doing work, doing the preventative maintenance, as you put it, which is Very a great cool. way to phrase it. There are a lot of people who go in and speak. There are a lot of people providing resources. The problem is, um, as important as that work is, and maybe someday I'll have the resources and have uh, team members around me who can address that on my behalf. But I think there's already so many great people doing that that I want it to be more so the person who catches the people on the back end. And I say that because you know how it is, man. Like someone can come in and do a workshop and share with you, hey, this is what you need to start thinking about and you know, life after sports and these are some things you wanna look out for. But it doesn't really become real until you're in it. Like me, even, even in 2013, man, we had people come in and talk to us about you know, financial literacy or just 
you know, hey, this is what you need to be thinking about. Football isn't forever. But at the end of the day, it's like as soon as that person is finished speaking, I'm trying to go to the cafeteria, get some chicken strips and get ready to go to practice. Yep. You know what I mean? And so, like, it, it's not like the information is great, but there's always going to be those athletes. And I was one of them who, like, it doesn't stick, especially for someone is like, yeah, that's great and everything, but I'm going pro and I'm going to have a 20 year career in the league. Like, there's always going to be the athletes who slip through the cracks, no matter how much preventative maintenance is done. And when they do, I'll be there focusing on building more resources around those people. Um, but I think the work is important because a lot of my, my, you know, partners do that type of work. I just know that my focus is on the athletes who, who need it, yeah. who, who are done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that answer because, again, like if you're everything to everyone, you're nothing to nobody, right? You are a specific mm -hmm. – you are here. You are here to do a job. You're going to kick ass at that job, and you're going to make sure you're going to get them through that transition period. How how are you trying to – how are you trying to let, let less people flounder? How are you trying to find them immediately after their school is done or like as quickly as possible without – having to go to that business and having to do this and having to do that and being like, I can see you there. Like I want to help, but like, I also need, like I have to find the funds to make sure that I can help you. Like, how are you trying to prevent as little time in between? Because that, that when that gap starts to grow and grow and grow and you know, you were lucky you got out of it in a year. I'm sure you know some people that didn't. And then, you know, people that went even longer and longer and eventually you're just like, what, like you're a totally different person at that point. So mm -hmm. how do cause I feel like the quicker you can get them, the quicker you can snap them out of it. Or at least that's, that would be my thinking of the whole thing. Right. The best thing that I have done or that I'm trying to do even more to address that is just making sure I have really strong relationships with people in athletic departments. And I say that because, you know, maybe we maybe they did, um, you know, help me find a donor or a sponsor to sponsor the work. And even if they don't, it's like just send people my way anyway. You know, I'm, I'm notorious for sending books. Uh, I'm not going to turn down a check either because I've also asked for money to send a bunch of books to athletic departments because that's a separate budget for tangible items. A lot of people don't tell you that. This guy. Man, so I had a lot of people put me on game about that with like if you tap into a certain budget, they can order two, three hundred books from you at a time. Um, but I'm trying to develop those relationships in athletic departments so people know of me, know I'm here and know that, look, I'm not asking for anything except give them a copy of my book send them like point them in my direction, tell them about the podcast because they're going to need it. If it's not right now, they might look at that book five years, you know, after graduation and be like, man, I never picked up this random book that I got, but let me check it out. And it could be exactly what they need in that moment. So that's what I'm focused on is, you know, but I'm trying to find more creative ways as well. Meaning like uh, one of the things that I'm kicking myself for not doing, or that I'm just going to start doing this year is building a community. And I'm not talking about like a Facebook group or anything like that, like an actual um, place where people that I've worked with can come together, collaborate on ideas and invite more people, former teammates, friends, family, people that they know to come together, not just for me, but to come together and help one another and let them know that they're not alone and share resources with each other. You know, that's awesome. I think you should make that a Facebook group if you don't have one already, because like that's a nice place to kind of keep everybody and then be like, Hey, this is the event that we're having this month. Here it is. You should come make sure you bring a friend, right? That, that makes a friend or a discord. Everybody loves discord. Now that might be kind of cool too, but no, I think that's, that's awesome. I think it's important. And again, just finding more ways to get in front of more people is really the name of the game. And the more and more often you can do that, like networking, I just wrote a name down of a person that I'd like to introduce you to. It's pretty high up in college athletics and there's an opportunity there. Hopefully that he can introduce you to, all of the athletic directors. So, right, like, that's what we're trying to do here. The more people that you know, the more people that you can help. Um, and clearly the passion comes through when you talk about it, right? And the fact that you went through it, and the fact that you're really not taking money from most of these people. You're, you're just trying to find ways to get enough money so you can, again, eat the food. Uh, I think that part is pretty important. And so you, you brought up uh, the content a little bit now, a couple of times, like talk, talk to us about some of your books. You got three books out there. You're doing a bunch of stuff. Like I wrote a book, by the way, not a big deal. Um, but like, what was it like writing those books? Like where'd the idea come from? Why did you get out there and say like, I think I should write a book. I think this is a good way to get in front of people. Yeah. First of all, man, I didn't know you wrote a book. I'm slipping. That's all good. I don't bring it up that often. Honestly, I did it a long time ago. I'll send you a copy. This isn't about me, Taj. This isn't about okay, me. Right, yeah, we'll your books. About we want to yeah, talk about your books. Let's do a book swap. Yeah. Um, I never intended on writing a book. I actually had a client who wanted to write a book, and I knew nothing about publishing or books or anything. So I started doing research, started asking around. I'm more like to ask around, like, who do you know? Because I want to get introduced to somebody who knows somebody, mm -hmm. who can, like verify the work. And uh met this publishing company, met the owner of the publishing company. He was a former football guy. 
we hit it off. He loved what I'm doing. We got the book done for my client. And then he starts talking to me about me doing my book. And I'm like, nah, I don't really like I, when people publish books, I think that's great. More power to them. But who am I to write a book was kind of like my limited belief. And he just explained to me, like, not only could this help enhance and further your mission and give you more credibility, because, you know, as well as I do, people treat you like a Ph.D. when you become an author, like all of a sudden you're an expert. Um, even, But anyway, so I ended up doing the book and. Um, you know, it was one of the things where once I saw what it did for me, not only from like a credibility standpoint, but how it opened up other streams of revenue and almost became like my business card when introducing myself to universities, sending them books. Um, once I realized the impact that it could have, because like, like I said, even if no one reads our books right now, they're still out there in the world floating around and it could reach that person at that perfect time. I was like, once I realized that, um, I was like, I want to help other people do it, you know? And so then I started coming up with like collaborative projects. Like those are the other two. I have a third one. So that'll be my fourth book technically, but one is the solo book. And then three of them are collaborative books where like myself and a bunch of other former athletes have come together to tell our stories, talking about different topics. But, um, that's how those books came about, man. I, I really have had a lot of fun with those. And it's kind of cool because it's like I helped people become published just by being like, hey, I want you to come tell your story in this book so we can, you know, help other athletes who went through what we went through. That's awesome. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun when I did it. But it sounds like, again, the, the opportunity to write that with other people and be able to kind of talk along and, and get, hey, we're doing it. To, you can show your you can help other people by sharing your story. I think that's the most important thing. And that's really why I started this show. Like so many people can learn from all the incredible people I've had on like yourself, like Malcolm, like had Richard Jefferson on maybe don't learn as much. That one's just kind of a feather in the cap, but like, you know, the opportunity that like there, there are so many cool people out there doing so many cool things. And if just one athlete hears about you, whether they reach out to you or not, like if they at least go to the podcast and check it out and see what's going on there, that's a win in my book, like a hundred percent a win in my book. And this thing's going to live on the internet forever. Hopefully that's the goal, right? So eventually someone will get there and eventually it'll help at least one person. And I consider that a pretty solid use of 45 minutes of my time. I don't know about you, Taj, but it's totally worth it in my end. So, um, you know, again, appreciate you coming on, man. I think this is awesome. You got the books. You got the podcast, obviously. So talk to us a little bit. But, I mean, if you go on a podcast and don't talk about the podcast that you podcast, do you really even podcast, right, man? So, like, talk talk to us a little bit about your show, what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, how often it comes out. Give us a little bit about that. That's good, man. That's funny. Um the podcast is not just me running my mouth. It's definitely started out that way. It was just like another content hub. I was like, Oh, nobody's watching my videos on YouTube. Let me put them in a podcast. Bang. And of course, more people, as you know, more people listen to the audio than will watch your YouTube video, which makes sense. People are busy. Yeah. Um, so that's why I started it. And like I said earlier to reach people who I know I will never talk to, but to have that information floating out there. And what it evolved into over time was not just solo episodes, but interviewing, you know, other great former athletes, them telling their transition stories, them giving advice, um, interviewing, especially people who are former athletes, but like have businesses or services that serve current and former athletes. So I'm now, you know, it's like a platform to like tell other people about other resources they can tap into aside from hearing a great story about how they got through their transition. Um, and then I interview clients too, man, not just for like, um, shameless self-promotion. Of course, there's a little bit of that there too. There I want better to let be. people know that what I'm doing is working. But it's also like I want people to hear the testimonials and, and interview. Sometimes I'll even do like a full out interview with the client so they can also tell their transition story. Like I graduated 10 years ago. I can only tell my transition story so many times. But for someone who just went through it, it it's just much more impactful to hear how that journey goes. So that's the podcast. It's called Thrive After Sports. Like everything else I do, it's available on all platforms. And. Yeah, man, encourage all your listeners to, to check it out. 100%. There will be links in the show notes on YouTube and on the audio version for everyone to check those out. I think that's awesome. But, yeah, man, I mean, do you have, like, a number of athletes you've helped or a number of people you've helped? Do you have, like, a ballpark? I'm kind of curious on the on the successes and some of the big breakthroughs you've had. Ballpark figure, I know it's over 100 and something one-on-one. -on -one. When I was doing group stuff, I would have anywhere between 5 to 10 at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, I've spoken at a couple universities and conferences too. So oh, like yeah. those are hard numbers to tally up, yeah, obviously. Yeah. but I know one-on-one -on -one clients, um, let's just say a hundred, a hundred plus. That's incredible. Then uh, all the others on top of it that we can't really tally up. I'm sure, you know, you've touched a lot of people in a lot of incredible ways, right? Just from that. But then again, the books, the podcast, and the thing about the books, that's always funny, not to digress, but like, I just get like a, 
fourteen dollar check from Amazon like every like month or whatever. And she's like, dude, that means that, like two or three people bought the book. That's awesome. That means it's working. Like that's the goal. So it's always funny when I get those, and then I go and I buy a beer with it. So it all, uh, nice. Yeah, everyone. It all works out in the end, right? Everyone gets what they want. But uh, no, in sincerity, man, I, I love it. I think what you're doing is awesome, Taj, and, and you know how you're doing it. How how can people reach out to you? How can they learn more about you? Again, everything will be in the show notes. But tell us uh, where they can find you and start having a conversation. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for having me on the show, first of all. Like, Pleasure's like said, all mine, I've been dude. Listening, I've been listening since uh, Malcolm Lemon's first episode, and mm-hmm. now you just dropped the third yeah, one. Yeah, we just did the third one, yeah. He's doing yeah, awesome man. stuff, dude. I love him. He's incredible. He really is. Um, you can learn more about me, just TajDeshaun.com, exactly how it's spelled on the screen, Bang. or if you're listening to the audio, just, you know, you'll find, or just Google Thrive After Sports. Thrive After Sports or Taj Deshaun. Uh, the website is the hub for everything. I'm most active on LinkedIn. I have a love-hate relationship with Instagram, but if you hit me up on there, I'll, I'll get you back. And um, all the books and my podcast links and stuff are, are on the website too, but probably just Googling Taj Deshaun or Thrive After Sports is the best way to go, and you'll find whatever you need. Beautiful. Love it, man. This has been absolutely fantastic. Appreciate the time. Fastest 45 minutes of your life, I bet, so I, I appreciate you there, man. Um, one last time, Taj Deshaun, athlete, transition coach, author, multiple books. Again, you'll see the links for those, host of the Thrive After Sports podcast, former Division One football player at Stony Brook. Taj, time's the only thing we don't get more of. Appreciate you giving me some of yours. I appreciate the audience for giving us some of theirs. But other than that, man, hope you have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Bye, everybody.